Um, we have a practice at NHGRI. Yeah, Vince, why don't you come on up? We have a practice at NHGRI of in inviting um, recently appointed senior leaders to come to the council, um, give a presentation about their uh, scientific goals and the vision of their institute, uh, and to have a conversation with the council about possible areas of common interest in terms of uh, research. Uh, today's guest speaker is uh, Dr. Eliseo Perez Stable. He is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And I've asked Vince Bonham to do his introduction to you. So good morning. Um, I am uh, so honored and pleased uh, to introduce Eliseo uh, Perez Estable, uh, who is the director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, conducts and supports research training, uh, research capacity building, infrastructure development, public education, and information dissemination programs to improve minority health and reduce health disparities. NIMHD is the lead organization at NIH for the planning, reviewing, and coordinating and evaluating minority health and health disparities research across NIH, so working with all of the 27 institutes and centers with regards to disparities research. Dr. Perez Estabable, uh, uh, his expertise spans a broad range of health disparities disciplines. His research interests have centered on improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, and improving cross-cultural communication skills among healthcare professionals and prompting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. He's recognized as a leader in Latino healthcare and disparities research, and he has spent 32 years leading research on smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in Latino populations in the United States, uh, addressing clinical and prevention issues in cancer screening and mentoring over 70 minority investigators. Prior to becoming the NIMHD director, he was a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He was the director of the UCSF Center for Aging uh, in Diverse Communities, which is funded uh, by the National Institute of Aging. And he was the director of the UCSF Medical Effectiveness Research Center for Diverse Populations. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2001 he earned his BA in chemistry from the University of Miami uh, and his medical degree from the University of Miami. And since his arrival at NIMHD, um, there's been really a new era of collaboration between NIMHD and NHGRI and also with a number of other institutes across NIH. And I just want to thank him for building the bridges around research initiatives between NHGRI <laughs> and pleased to have him here today. Um, thank you for the uh, kind introduction, Vince, and uh, Eric for inviting me. And uh, it's, I'm pleased to present to you this morning on sort of what the vision and agenda for our institute is. And I'll start by reviewing history. Um, this was our IC was uh, actually initially an office under the NIH director uh, that was established in 1990 <clears throat> by then Secretary uh, Lewis Sullivan. Uh, subsequently, was transitioned to be a center. Uh, in, by the year 2000, uh, championed by the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, particularly Representative Lewis Stokes. Um, that probably was the critical step in that it afforded us uh, ability to, uh, to have a grant portfolio. And then as part of the uh, ACA uh, legislation in 2010, it was transitioned to an institute. Uh, and there were a number of legislators involved in that. Dr. John Ruffin was the director uh, through all these entities until his retirement uh, a little over two years ago. And then Yvonne Maddox became acting uh, until I started uh, on September 1. So this is my ninth month, not yet uh, full gestation. Um, and um, our budget, as you can see, is 280 million. Uh, this is with the extra 3% we got in December. Uh, we are the second smallest institute, although the two other centers, Fogarty and Complementary medicine are also smaller than we are. So our mission, as Vince uh, outlined, is really to lead scientific research on advances in minority health and health disparities. And I'll spend a little time differentiating and uh, defining those two. 
um, support research in minority health as defined by the census, and then also understand the causes and re to reduce that the lead to and reduce health disparities uh, in specific populations. Although we have a limited training portfolio, we are very uh, interested in promoting diversity in the scientific workforce. I, I think this is a, a crisis that the profession faces uh, on both the clinical and scientific fronts, and we are very supportive of the efforts that Hannah Valentine and all the institutes are doing on this, on this area. And then, of course, communicating to the public uh, and to our colleagues, as well as fostering uh, collaborations and partnerships both within NIH and uh, outside. So our definition of minority health is to look at distinctive characteristics within these uh, minority racial ethnic groups in the U.S., and I'll go over those for a minute. There is a common social disadvantage that uh, these groups have been subject to some level of discrimination. It's a common theme. It's not all equal. Uh, there's clearly a legacy of slavery in the U.S. that is distinct and disproportionately affects African Americans, but uh, all of the minority groups share some level of, uh, of, of discrimination. It coincides that they're also uh, almost universally were underrepresented in any biomedical research regarding humans, and most of them are also underrepresented in the scientific workforce. The exception to this are the uh, certain Asian uh, national origin groups, particularly from the north uh, east part of uh, Asia and South Asia. These are the, mi the minority health populations in the U.S. by the Office of, Mi of uh, Management and Budget. This is what they define, whether we like it or not, this is what we live with. And this mandates our minority health component of our institute. African American or black, Asian, which are very heterogeneous and represent over 30 different countries in, uh, in really dozens of languages. American Indian or Alaska Native. Native, Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, and here I, I will emphasize that this group is different than Asian, even though we frequently see it lumped together with, uh, with Asian. And then Latino or Hispanic, which is actually an a ethnic group. Um, all of this, of course, is driven by self-identification, and this is an issue that uh, has been accepted both by the census and by the uh, scientific community that deals with minority health and health disparities, that is the gold standard is self-identification of race, ethnicity. We are told that the 2020 census is considering uh, using a single question again and making it race or ethnicity, so that right now it's uh, Latino, Hispanic ethnicity is ascertained first and then they ask race, um, and they're also proposing adding another ethnic group to this uh, options, uh, which is uh, North African Middle Eastern, and we'll see what happens since I, think, I assume this, these need congressional approval. <clears throat> Health disparity populations includes not only the race ethnic groups, but also low socioeconomic status and underserved rural residents. And by low SES, we mean essentially uh, people with less formal education or low income or otherwise disadvantage and uh, others who may also be subject to discrimination or have poor health outcomes attributed to this social disadvantage. The groups that are, uh, the main group that is under discussion actively now uh, is uh, sexual gender minorities, uh, although it has not uh, yet been processed fully by the department. Um, and we uh, believe that these, uh, these individuals also have on being underserved in, in, uh, in healthcare. Now, as director of NIMHD, I am uh, empowered uh, on paper to uh, make that decision, although I don't think Dr. Collins would uh, uh, let that happen uh, exclusively. Uh, and it also says that uh, director of ARC, of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, is, consults with me on this. If you look at ARC's uh, list of uh, disparity populations, you can see it's quite inclusive. Uh, and you'd wonder who is left uh, after seeing that list. But it is, a dis it is actually, they call it a priority population and not disparity. So they don't make that, dis they do make that distinction. And so I would emphasize that all of these groups could potentially be considered, although uh, we emphasize the top three as uh, listed in, in, this, uh, in this slide. So health disparities uh, is then the difference that adversely affects a disadvantaged population based on one or more health outcome. Um, and then our research, our science, is devoted to knowing why uh, these different health determinants or factors lead to these differences, uh, the mechanism uh, pathways that this happens, and then 
uh, developing and, and testing interventions to decrease uh, these disadvantages. Um, eventually, hopefully, in some cases, eliminate them. Um, we've come to uh, this consensus on these four outcomes that we want to emphasize. They're common ones, higher incidence or prevalence or premature or excess mortality in diseases where populations differ. Some global burden of disease measure, disability adjusted life years being a common one used in global health, uh, and so therefore I think one that we would adopt. And anything that is related to um, patient or population reports or individual reports on health-related quality of life, daily functioning, and emphasize using standardized measures that have already been uh, made, found to be uh, both reliable and valid uh, in testing the outcome of interest. These are some of the risk outcomes or the mechanisms that we are interested in, whether it be lifestyle, uh, issues around stress, whether it be biology or epigenetic risks that lead to um, greater susceptibility, faster progression, or greater severity. Things around clinical events that adversely impact health, this relates to both uh, differential treatments that happen in the healthcare setting, uh, adverse events of medications, falls, or progression of disease. In other words, trans, uh, uh, progressing from chronic kidney disease to dialysis is a major event, doesn't change diagnosis, yet it becomes an important uh, mechanism for disparities. Um, and then utilization of care, uh, whether it be lack of access, uh, abuse or use of appropriate services, but screening, hospitalizations, uh, et cetera. An area I think that uh, on a disparity perspective has a lot to uh, l be learned. Um, I like to use a simple uh, diagram of saying what minority health and health disparities are about. They do have uh, overlapping variants, but they do explain separate or independent variants. And similarly, with race, ethnicity, and social class, or SES, uh, these are intermingled, uh, overlap, but do have independent variants. It's not all about social determinants, yet, and it isn't all about race, ethnicity uh, issues either. Our scientific staff developed this um, uh, overall framework to try to capture uh, what our science is. And it, it was derived in part from work that I did while I was on NIA's council with Marie Bernard, Carl Hill, and Norman Anderson, where we published a, a framework of research in disparities in aging uh, in research. And it tries to present the idea that this is not uh, a simple uh, one dimension of research, but we really are focused on biological, behavioral, environmental influences, uh, both physical and social cultural ones, as these relate to the healthcare system. Um, and then across the, uh, the, the spectrum of individual, interpersonal, community-based, and societal uh, ones. So the individual behavior mechanisms and biology are obviously important, and interpersonal interactions uh, social networks is a powerful um, uh, uh, factor that we have, don't fully understand as how it relates to both the family as well as one's community, uh, and then the broader community and society as it relates to uh, policy. And, uh, and in thinking about health disparities, all of these factors are, are really interacting, and we are focused on all of these uh, re with regards to health outcomes. Um, in, uh, in looking at race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and rural. To move on to a, a different and related topic, inclusion uh, of minorities in clinical studies is not minority health. Um, so if you have a research project where 40% of your sample is minority and you're asking a question that's fundamental in your science, uh, that's great, but it's not minority health just because you have minorities in it, and it has been some confusion around that topic at NIH for many years, and we want to clarify that. We're in the process of doing that, so I'll keep repeating it until we finalize it. Um, but we do want to call it uh, inclusion, and I think it's something that's very important. We've, we're all familiar with the tables that our investigators, uh, that we filled out as investigators on our grants uh, for women uh, and minority groups and, and children and the very old also need to be in this, in this consideration, and we have to differentiate U.S. and international um, uh, participants in our studies. Um, this is an issue of social justice, good science, as hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll find out, and then common sense, since almost 40 percent of the U.S. population now is one of those four, one of those minority groups I outlined before. 
And then the fourth uh, issue is the workforce diversity. As I said, it's an urgent societal issue. It has been very slow incremental change over the 30 plus years I've been um, in um, uh, a physician. And, uh, and we're not there, we're far from there. And I think in the clinical world, there's been some, a little bit more progress, you know, 10, 12% of the clinicians are now uh, underrepresented minorities and- Please uh, pardon the interruption. Your conference contains less than three participants at this time. If you would like to continue, press star one now. Happens everywhere, right? <laughs> Happens at the uh, IC directors' meetings too, um, and uh, and less than five percent of our NIH submitted grants or funded grants are actually by uh, with African American or Latino uh, principal investigators. Um, I, I, you know, Dr. Collins and Dr. Tabak have really taken this on. Hannah Valentine was hired. We've been very rigorously looking at uh, what has happened with this and try to define interventions independent of what's already happened for the pipeline to try and improve this. Um, but I think these data are, uh, are compelling in and of themselves, and if we don't do Please something about it. Your conference um, contains less than three participants at this time. If you would like to continue, press star one now, or the conference will be terminated. All right. Uh, I can only hope, right. So let me, final, let me finish by, by saying a few things about some uh, research issues. Um, uh, without going through an extensive uh, uh, review of our portfolios or looking at the broad view of things, these are some topics that I think are familiar to all of you that are relevant in disparities and genetics. And cancer is the obvious one where I'll show you some data from breast, but you know, even just today, uh, Eric talked about a prostate cancer uh, report. Uh, colon cancer has, has identified some, uh, some predisposing uh, um, uh, loci that uh, increased in African Americans, where we do see an excess rate. Lung cancer, um, multiple myeloma. So this is where probably most of the work you're familiar with. Uh, just last week, there was a, a paper published um, out of UCSF uh, on asthma in African Americans on some uh, susceptibility uh, uh, genes that were only uh, found in African American children. Uh, diabetes with Mexican Americans having a, a two to fourfold increased rate of diabetes is not just about behavior or uh, obesity or lack of physical activity, it's, there's, uh, there's a genetic predisposition. And, and most of you are familiar with the APOL1 story in chronic kidney disease, which is a significant increased risk for uh, chronic kidney disease among, uh, predominantly among African Americans uh, that is found uh, in a significant number uh, of the U.S. African American population. These are SEER rates for um, uh, cancer in women. Uh, and just taking one look at this with this very global category of of race, ethnicity, and notice here that Asian Pacific Islanders are lumped together. One has to see that race does matter uh, in, in uh, thinking about uh, disease, because you see these dramatic differences uh, in rates that are not always explainable. Uh, cervical cancer, we think, is caused by infectious agents, so we can, uh, we can see that, and, but it's the least common of these. But let me focus for a minute on breast cancer and just tell you quickly about a story that probably many of you are familiar with. Um, for many years, we've known Latinas or Hispanic women have lower risk of breast cancer. A number of years ago, a group uh, uh, at UCSF led by uh, Elad Ziv and uh, actually Laura Ferriman is the first author, looked at uh, ancestral markers uh, and uh, in a case control design in the Bay Area and found that, and this is a study that already existed, immigrants and less acculturated uh, women were protected from breast cancer and then found that a European ancestry was associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. And, and after adjustment with all the other risks for breast cancer that were collected in that study, the odds ratio was attenuated to 1.39 but was remained significant. They replicated this with a similarly designed case control study in Mexico, uh, although again the odds ratio was somewhat attenuated in, in, the, in those results. And then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in lumping together a number of samples in Northern California and Southern California, including the multi-ethnic cohort study, um, they uh, look for, were looking for uh, a genetic association with uh, lower risk of breast cancer among Lat women of Latin American uh, origin. 
um, and then replicated it with a number of other uh, studies that were available from Mexico, Columbus Consortium, and Women's Health Initiative. Um, they found um, a site in the estrogen receptor uh, gene area that was significantly associated with lower risk of breast cancer. Um, the odds ratios were consistently uh, in the 0.6 uh, range uh, for this study, uh, including uh, it, with a trend towards this being actually more significant in estrogen receptor negative breast cancers, although this is not uh, yet to really uh, 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 found on, on strong evidence. Um, and the gene is present in 15 percent of Latina women, uh, if Mexican and Central American, all of indigenous American uh, ancestry, that, that's where the location is. The gene has not been found in other populations. I think there, as of the time that this was published uh, in, uh, in Nature Communications, there was one person in China and one person somewhere else where that had this uh, allele, but it's predominantly a, uh, a, an American, uh, a Latin American allele, and it's 15 percent, so it's not uncommon. So again, this is not something that would have been uh, sought for or thought of, even though it's not in a new area, um, without knowing, A, the epidemiology uh, that was different, and then pursuing it with this population in mind. Uh, as, and it is a protective gene, which is sort of a, um, a, a, a nice twist, as opposed to a susceptibility or increased risk gene. Uh, these are some grants that we fund that are uh, in the genetics uh, space. Um, we're also, I think, uh, want to mention we're, uh, we support the H3 Africa initiative and have been, have been and will continue to support it. Um, the triple negative breast cancer access among African Americans, also among Latinos, although that has been less well publicized. Uh, biological environmental modifiers of vitamin D3 and prostate cancer, um, issues around clinical sequencing uh, uh, with the CSER2 sites. Um, with uh, Eric's support, we actually partnered on uh, the new round of uh, CSER. Uh, by also having Genome uh, partner with us on our precision medicine um, uh, centers that we uh, are either about to fund or, 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 or just funded. Uh, there will be uh, at least three that are funded, and, uh, and uh, we will be partnering scientifically on that. There's no uh, net exchange of funding, but mostly just a, a sort of a collaboration. And then, of course, the APOL1 understanding basis of disparities in rates of kidney disease. Uh, particularly around, there's been a lot done around transplant um, uh, issues, but uh, there are other issues related to APOL1 that need attention. Um, our priorities are really focused on science and health disparities in minority health in the framework I presented. Um, I don't want NIMHD to be about uh, anything else. It's about what we do. We are definitely uh, involved in social determinants. Uh, and behavior, as well as biology, and all of these factors are, are important. Uh, I want to do more in the health services world and um, the health care setting uh, across the spectrum, so from primary care to the hospital. Um, this is uh, not an area I think that NIH has been heavily uh, emphasizing in the past, but I think we, we have something special there in terms of health disparities in minority health. And by De facto, that means collaboration with other agencies like uh, AHRQ or PCORI. Um, uh, I want to rebalance our portfolio, so we've been predominantly uh, funding centers, and I want to have a more balanced portfolio where we have more R01 science, as well as continue to promote diversity in the workforce um, and, and emphasize uh, population and community health. We've uh, uh, created three branches within our scientific programs. Up until now, there were no uh, branches. It was all just one big uh, program, and these are our, our programs. It's just emerging, so we're still in the development phase and need a new branch chief and need more scientists. So if you know anyone, uh, send them our way. Um, these are uh, concepts that we've cleared and that we have uh, coming out uh, program announcements. Uh, the health services research one is already out. Uh, there's one on HIV treatment, there's one on immigrant populations, which will be very broad, uh, focused on etiologies and interventions. There's one on disparities in surgical care, social epigenomics for minority health and health disparities as well. These are all approved and in process. Um, we are going to host, uh, uh, we're 
we're planning to host three additional scientific workshops. Uh, we're concluding this visioning uh, uh, process that was started by Dr. Maddox before I arrived. We had a measurement and methods conference in April, and this week we're having etiologies and interventions. Uh, this is trans-NIH as well as external scientists who are coming, uh, and hopefully we'll come to some closure on that, reflecting a little bit the vision I presented as well as more detail of the content of the science. Um, we want to have a IT uh, information technology in minority health and health disparities, and the National Science Foundation has uh, wants to partner with us on that. We're working with NHGRI on the issue of phenotype versus genotype, uh, sort of revisiting that, uh, mostly just to bring clarity to the field for community sake of where, where we stand on this, both from, from both perspectives. I think it's a, it's a good, it's been about 10, 12 years since the last time this was done at NIH. And then um, one on structural racism and cultural competence. These are constructs that I have always um, uh, wondered whether they're research constructs, they're really more systems constructs, and I'm not clear that there is a research agenda to pursue here, but they're important constructs and, and have some sort of a, a, an agreement on where we should go. If there is research to be done to help define those areas, and the Office of Minority Health is very interested in, uh, in this topic on the cultural competence side, but I think there's uh, also worthwhile to go through that. We're having um, a, a Disparities Research Institute, so uh, this summer. It's intended to be um, uh, bringing in, you know, promising scientists who are interested in minority health and health disparities, and this can be my ideal candidate for this is senior postdocs to mid-assistant professors, uh, not R01 funded yet, so the people who might might benefit from a one-week exposure to some in-depth uh, presentations, networking with uh, extramural scientists who will bring, as well as us, uh, us meaning NIH, uh, and, uh, and it'll be in the summer, so uh, whoever we can get. Uh, and we are, uh, it's a change of what NIMHC has done in the last five years, but I, I think this is uh, the direction I want to see us in invest this effort in. And finally, I'll mention our intramural program, which has been essentially non-existent. Um, uh, we have uh, allocated 2 percent of our budget to intramural. Uh, tragically, both the scientific director and the clinical director uh, passed away shortly after Dr. Ruffin retired, um, and so I got a blank slate. And option one was, why well, have one? Uh, and when I figured out what I, we could do with it, I said, of course I want one. Uh, and option two is what are we going to do with it, and I think that it's going to be focused on population science uh, with uh, probably a, some sort of a clinical component. It's still very much in flux. My first step was to recruit a scientific director. Kevin Gardner has been acting and done a wonderful job of it, uh, and we have an ad out uh, for a senior scientist. We will have a di scientific director and then a second, immediately following a second recruit of an established scientist to help. Uh, set this up. You know, one of the ideas is a new cohort study, maybe of immigrants, uh, something to be defined. Uh, the other component has been to network with other institutes, uh, programs with similar interests. And we have, I think, through Kevin's work, been able to network with, uh, well, um, genome as well as aging, uh, uh, NHLBI, NCI, uh, NIDDK, and child health, uh, where there are scientists either or recruit, new recruit new recruits or established scientists in these institutes that have an interest in minority health and health disparities and try to create a, a monthly seminar and create some synergy and mutual support around this topic without necessarily being uh, funded all by NIMHD. We are, of course, supporting some of the, some of these efforts. Uh, so I think I've probably gone longer than I should have. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, Vince, if I have time. Yeah, so thank you. So I had a question for you having to do with uh, outreach to potential research subjects and what role you think your institute plays in um, helping spread the word that uh, disparity research as well as minority health research requires involvement of people of minority backgrounds. Right. So, um, <laughs> so just to clarify, so uh, our research participants' involvement in studies with hum uh, on human beings should be across the board include minorities. 
So whether it is a minority health question or whether it's a disparities question or just, you know, a question, right, <laughs> that involves recruitment. And I think this is what we're calling inclusion. Um, if the research is focused on a minority health question, intra-group or comparison of groups, even if the outcome is actually favorable, let's say uh, uh, Latinos are, uh, have uh, lower rates of heart disease than whites, so it's not technically a disparity, uh, but yet we want to know questions about that, and so we would do a study like that. Or African Americans have lower rates of uh, suicide, uh, and we want to ask questions about why that might be and, and the mechanisms for that. Um, and then disparities includes more than minorities. It includes people of socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, my own personal view on this is that those are the fundamental pillars of health disparities in the United States today. Uh, there are, you know, probably half a dozen other groups that would uh, make a case for their inclusion. <laughs> We do have rural underserved residents in our sort of mandate. Um, clearly, there are some rural populations that are not um, underserved or, or, or have disparities. You know, the, either Jackson Hole or let's say the ranchers in Central California are not, but certainly, you know, West Virginia, uh, the rural South. Much of that is driven, I think, by social class and race ethnicity, but uh, that is uh, one of our options. So that's the, the clarity I, I want to. Uh, we want to bring to this. Uh, we presented this to <clears throat> everywhere, and once we got some sense of, of it, since January, I've been presenting to different councils. I presented IC directors meeting, and I, I don't think that there is any fundamental disagreement with this view uh, based on, so far, what I've heard. So we have Eric, and then Janita, and then Gail. First, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us. Many of the people in the NHGRI community, many of the people around this table are very interested in genomic medicine, mm -hmm. pushing the findings from genomics into the translational space. That's going to expand as we build the precision medicine initiative and start to realize translational results there. However, often the valve that controls the uptake of this new technology is the payers themselves, the insurance companies, mm -hmm. for example. And I have a concern that, in fact, the discussion in our hearts, frankly, are wanting to use these new findings to reduce health disparities. But my concern is if we're not proactive, they're actually going to increase health disparities because only the wealthy can, can afford it. So how do we make sure that genomic medicine, precision medicine, is not really medicine for the wealthy, it's medicine for everyone? Well, you highlight a really critical point that I think we all need to sort of keep front and center as we move forward. The experience with um, uh, IT uptake is one that we can look on as a possible way. So minorities and people of less or more disadvantaged socioeconomic status ha have been, were initially left behind when we went to, let's say, electronic medical records and the ability to see your medical records and communicate with your doctor. But what we've seen with time is that this lag has been closed and there has been catch-up. And in the more recent uh, uptakes of EMR, uh, minorities have been as, uh, almost as engaged as whites or the higher socioeconomic status group. But I share your concern. I do think that, you know, the digital divide could uh, worsen disparities. And so unless we put that as uh, front and center in our discussions, uh, this could happen. If you have to you know, pay $50,000 a dose for a biological agent uh, to, that, that leads to 70 percent remission of a particular cancer, then there are some people who are not going to be able to access it. And so uh, some of it has to come from government regulation, uh, some of it has to come from the providers of the agents, uh, and some of it has to come from the research that, you know, the, the knowledge that we generate to make this something accessible. When we do find uh, treatments that really make a difference. So I, I thank you for your comments there. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation and overview of, of NIMHD. I um, am actually really excited about the vision you um, put forward and was just curious about two things. Um, one was what your vision was for the R01 program and portfolio, and do you see that <coughs> unfolding in the way that um, sort of the the framework that you outlined for minority health and health disparities, or do you have a different vision for that? 
And then my second question is related to um, an initiative that predates you, and it's the community-based participatory research um, centers, and whether or not you see that having um, a role in the future of NIMHD. Right. So um, thank you for your questions and comments. Um, uh, as a recent extramural uh, scientist, I know that there's a community of investigators out there who focus on, this, on these topics, minority health and health disparities. And they haven't seen NIMHD as a source unless they got central funding uh, because there were no R01s. Uh, so NIMHC only signed up to the parent R01 two years ago, under uh, when Yvonne first uh, became acting. Uh, and so we get a trickle of R01s uh, compared to other institutes with, uh, you, know, our budget, you know, adjusting for budget size. So I want to see that grow. Uh, that's why we're putting out program announcements and saying we are interested in grants in this area, in that area. And it's not meant to be this is all we're going to fund at all. I think I really want just to get people's you know, creative juices going um, and, and have them look at us as a place to send grants. Uh, and the, the, the concepts we've approved and the couple more that we're going to propose to council next month uh, are ones that came out of program scientists, um, you know, I maybe had a little influence on some of them, uh, out of our meetings and discussions about scientific areas. And we're not done. I mean, the idea is to keep generating these and, and put them out. But I very much want to see anything that, you know, good idea that a, that a scientific uh, community sends in and then have the same problem all the other institutes have of we can't fund all the good science that's out there, uh, which is, I think, is a, a good place to be. That's balanced with our centers, which we need to maintain, and although it's going to be a balancing of the portfolio. Um, the CBPR is... Um, you know, I'm very much in support of community engagement and community-based research. I'm not religious <laughs> about CBPR. Um, and NIMHD has been sort of the main place where CBPR has uh, thrived at NIH with uh, some other programs, let's say at NCI I was familiar with. Or I'm sure other ICs have had them as well, but not as uh, much. So um, they will be part of our, you know, we, you know, one of the many things that we will be supporting. I don't think we're going to have a specific CVPR uh, sort of say set aside, uh, to put it that way. But the centers, our ones, you know, they will definitely be considered, and we will give them fair evaluation, you know, good evaluation as a scientific method, not sort of say, oh, this is no good because it's community based. So does that answer your question? And I didn't. Fully answer your point about recruitment science. Really, I think that was what you were going at, and and I think we've people have done this several times over the last two decades, and I, I also sense the need that to bring people back together at some point um, to say, okay, what are best practices? Because uh, NIDDK, uh, NINDS has a whole program that we are participating in. It's been a big issue with PMI. Um, I think the CSER came up when I was there back in September. So I think that it's time to revisit. And, and there's not going to ever be like, this is the best science on it. I mean, it's almost like a, uh, you know, a, an expert opinion uh, and common practice that people will say, this works, and then create some sort of a common ground that we can refer people to. So there's been a fair amount done, though, in this, in this space. Yeah, although, th thank you, Lisa. That, that was really what, what, I, was, what I was driving at. Um, but, but I think two things. One is, of course, it's a moving target mm -hmm. because, you know, things are not the same as they were 10 or 20 years ago. And, and, and secondly, I think the, the clarity you're bringing to the distinction between inclusion and minority health research um, is an important distinction, and it's worth thinking about uh, in this area of um, recruitment science. Gail. Yeah, and I join the chorus of thanking you because it's awfully nice to meet you and it's nice, wonderful to hear uh, your vision for Thank this you. new institute or relatively new. Um, my question is um, about five slides before you finished. You mentioned uh, target areas that you want to bring people together to revisit um, one and one at the third out of four. You don't have to pull it up necessarily, but mm -hmm. was um, 
really looking at the relationship between self-identified right. race and ethnicity and biological uh, genetic sci genome science. Right. And of course, this is the bugaboo that has really plagued sort of everybody. And whenever anybody talks about this, they have to go over, like, okay, race, it's a social con and, and so I, I like how you started, like, with your, um, your, your program and that se self-identified race, ethnicity is how you envision a lot of the work because, of course, a lot of it is, that's what determines health and access to health care. But then I'm very curious about what your vision is for that one bullet and how you hope to move that conversation forward. It's a really tough one. And we've got all these Caesar grants that are going to come in and they're going to try and argue that they're getting, uh, they're, they're going to focus on inclusion of underrepresented groups because of the value for genome science. So they're going to have to address how do they how do they recruit them, measure them, how to define them. So I'm so curious what you're going to do with that bullet. Um, well, if I if I had a sort of a, a future lens, I could we could find out. Uh, we have even a tentative date. I'm not sure if that's going to hold up sometime in October. So uh, we're partnering with uh, Vince uh, is really leading this for um, uh, genome and 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 we're uh, working actively on setting defining the agenda. The whole notion is this, you know. Many years ago, much of my sort of scientific community said, okay, race and ethnicity are social constructs, and this is how we define it. And there was this whole thing, well, the genome is, there's more intra-individual variation than there is between groups, and this is 90s uh, kind of discourse. Um, with the genome uh, definition and the ancestral marker became a tool, it became a tool to discovery. And I showed you one product of that. I think there's a number of other, you know, active research areas in that, uh, particularly interesting in the admixed populations, of which Latin Americans are. Uh, Hispanic Latin Americans are very admixed, 500 years of admixture, so it's an interesting blend of uh, three major racial groups. Uh, similarly, you could look at Hawaii that way or, you know, India maybe. Uh, those are the three groups that come to mind. Uh, so I always thought it's a tool. It's a tool for exploration and discovery. It doesn't replace the social construct. When all the ancestral marker stuff started coming out in the early part of the 21st century, um, the social scientists I knew got very nervous about this. And they kind of like, I would talk about it, I would bring it up, and they'd, they'd get very upset about, you know, you're, you're defining race as a genetic thing, is it deterministic? And, and then on the other hand, meetings I didn't go to, a geneticist, <laughs> were also thinking, well, maybe this is what we're really going to focus on. So I think we need to come to some sort of mutual um, consensus at NIH, and I don't think we're, well, I think we have, sort of have it, but really maybe put it down as saying, you know, what we, what are, because I think if you go one way or the other with exclusion, you're missing part of the picture. And as far as I'm concerned, at least while I'm alive, race will continue to be a social construct. And someday maybe everybody will admix and then we'll just be all humans and maybe that'll happen, although it hasn't happened yet and it won't happen in the near future. Given social, cultural, political, and all these other reasons why people don't mix, even if you put them all together in one place, in one country, um, so I think it's a you know it's a it's a tremendous opportunity for scientific knowledge advancement, uh, using these tools for both discovery and associations. Now, whether or not is Charles here with you? Uh, no, he would say, well, at some point, patients will come in and say, well, here's my ancestral mix. And this is what you should know for precision medicine, because drug A works in this group and not works in that group, or drug B, or if this disease is, if you have this, is, and maybe that, that's where we'll go in the future. I'm not saying that's not likely, but we're not there yet. I mean, except for cancer and, of course, some unusual diseases, uh, we're, not, we're not at that point yet in the clinical arena, although it will be, you know, maybe in the future. That'll be sooner, I think. Does that help? Last question. So I let Vince uh, introduce you, so maybe I get to thank you. And that thank seems you. fair. I would say, and I think you can quickly see, 
Um, Alice, he's been a terrific addition to the group of institute and center directors. He's also been a quick study. He's only been here nine months. He's very quickly learning. C considering you came from outside the government, I always have great admiration for people outside the government come into a job like this. It's so much you have to learn just about all the government speak, and he's just done this fantastically, but also you can see brings an incredibly collegial spirit that is, uh, is just wonderful to have, and we really already regard him as a great friend of the Institute, and I am sure you'll be hearing more about interactions between our two institutes in the coming months and years. So thank you for thank you, coming Eric. and meeting our council and, and vice versa. Thank you. Vince wants the last word. I just want to follow I always up give it to on, him. on the question about the meeting. Um, Larry Brody and I are uh, leading the planning from NHGRI. So if you have any feedback, because we're still developing this meeting uh, throughout the day, please come up to one of us and just share your thoughts and comments. Okay. All right. Uh, good news is it's on to lunch. Uh, believe it or don't, we have instructions for lunch. Uh, the reason there are instructions is that uh, we need to take the uh, annual council photo. And uh, for the first time in two and a half weeks, we have decent weather. So uh, comfort's going to lead you out to the steps over by the parking garage. The experienced council members know where that is. So if you're new, just latch on to somebody. Won't take long to do the picture. Once it's done, please go into the cafeteria. It's on the ground floor of this building. Procure your lunch if you want a lunch. And then your executive session with Eric gets moved today, since it's a one-day council meeting. That's going to take place uh, on the fourth floor in the conference room there. So take the elevator up to the fourth floor. When you get off the elevator, there's a double glass door. There'll be someone at the desk to admit you, and the conference, conference room is right there. We will resume the um, and complete. So what, when do we, when, so they should get their line. So we're going to meet up on the fourth floor, just me and council alone in the room. Correct. Probably by 12, 20, 12, whenever they get right. food. And then, and then we should. Back here at 1.30. Okay. So we'll resume the open session at 1.30 in this room. Okay. Everybody follow that? So I'll see you guys on the fourth floor. After the photo. First, everybody to the photo, and then up to the fourth. Get your lunch up get to the lunch, fourth, fourth floor. floor. Great. Great. Right. Yes. Yep. Somebody. You can leave stuff. You can leave stuff here. If you, Whatever you need for the executive session, take with you.